Hey everybody, the August 2023 Roundup is brought to you by Arcane Wonders in their new gorgeous tile-laying game, Neotopia, which is set in the year 2055, and players are competing to contribute the most to this beautiful, futuristic city where everyone's needs are met with these gorgeous acrylic tiles that represent agriculture, energy, community living, and technology. And every turn, you are going to be doing a combination of grabbing contract cards and getting tiles laid out in the communal board to complete those cards, like this picture, where we needed three agriculture next to two automation to score points, because that is the future. Um, but the trick is those tiles, to grab them, they are on three different conveyor belts that you have access to in different ways, depending on where you're building in the city. And the trick is you have to build equally well in all all three of the districts of the city, and both players are building in the same areas at the same time. So you're constantly worried about creating opportunities for each other, but also seizing opportunities when your opponents give them to you. And this is just barely scratching the surface. There's special powers, all kinds of extra stuff. And if you'd like to know a bit more about Neotopia, folks, in uh, the month of September, we're going to be doing a full run-through of the game. So you can look forward to that. I'm excited for you to learn more. And thanks to Arcane wonders for supporting the show and hello everybody oh my goodness 23 games i've got to tell you about because it's the busiest time of the year after gen con before s and spiel games are just coming through the door non-stop and i try to play as many of them as i can so i can let you know what are the best which ones we enjoyed the most and so like i said jen and i we played 23 games this month actually 24 uh but i can't talk about one of them uh because it's under embargo but anyway of the 23, I'm going to be counting them down from our least favorite to our most favorite. I'll be giving you a new game of the month. And uh, yeah, there's going to be links for more information or run-throughs where possible about all these games down in the show notes. So if any of this sounds interesting, you know where to go to learn more. Right. Okay. Are you ready, folks? Uh, then get comfortable because the countdown begins with number 23 on the list, My City, Roll and Write. And now, this is, not surprisingly, a Roll and Write version of My City from Dr. Reiner Knizia. And Jen and I loved My City. We thought that was absolutely phenomenal, legacy style, uh, polyomino Roll and Write. And this, or not uh, polyomino tile layer, but this Roll and Write captures all the feel of that, including the campaign play. Not legacy. This is not a legacy game. You're not destroying anything, but you're just playing through 12 different missions where the rules change and evolve, even if the core game is always all about trying trying to build buildings based on what the dice roll. And the dice are probably the coolest thing about this, because you roll three, two of them combine to create a unique polyomino shape, and then the other one tells you what type of building, whether it's a solid, a stripey, or an X building. And you're trying to do things like get buildings next to each other, or, uh, I mean, basically, I, I'm not even going to list all the different objectives that come and go as you play through this big campaign, even though each individual session just lasts about 20 minutes. It's fun, just like My City was fun. Uh, we enjoyed it. I think this is a great introduction to Polyomino, tile lane games, and roll and rights. A uh, good gateway style game. My only real problem with it is, the way the dice work, there is a very high... A likelihood that two shapes will come up. This kind of chevron size three polyomino and a one by two. Those come up like probably at least 50% of the time. Sometimes we went through entire games and we saw almost nothing but that. And I wish the dice could have been tweaked a little bit so they'd be more inclined to show off different shapes. When those different shapes show up, it's awesome because the most fun part of a polyomino tile layer is trying to puzzle all the pieces together. And with these dice, it's often the case that, oh, they make it really easy because we get the easy shapes over and over and over again. And now, like I said, that's what makes this a great gateway introduction to uh, polyominoes. I could totally use it that way. But for me and Jen, we love a brain burny uh, tile layer that really pushes us through the limits with big, complex shapes. And the dice in this game just aren't inclined to give those to you. The game pretty much takes it easy on you. So, as a gateway, it's great. But for me and Jen, um, we're looking for heavier stuff with our polyomino tile layers, which is why uh, My City Roll and Write comes in at number 23 for the month. Okay, <clears throat> excuse me. Now let's move on to number 22, 
Sea Dragons. Wow, this one really surprised me. Now, at its heart, this is another really kind of lightweight, gateway, family-friendly style game. In fact, I could almost imagine this game winning the Spiel des Jahres. In fact, I'm calling it now, folks. Whenever this game eventually makes it to Germany that year, if this doesn't win the Spiel des Jahres, I think it'll get a runner-up, you know, nominated. Because at its heart, this is such a fun, simple polyomino tile style tile land game. Every round, you've got two cards. You're going to play one of them that tells you the shape of Sea Dragon you can deploy out into the ocean. And these are just fun and satisfying to do because they're all kinds of wiggly shapes with the long tails of the Sea Dragon. And what we're trying to do is deploy them such that we sink nasty pirate ships and find all kinds of loot and plunder. The tricky thing is, we always have to lay them down extending from our opponent Sea Dragons. And whenever I put one of my sea dragons next to one of your sea dragons, you get a benefit as well, which is going to help you build in the future. So there's a lot of indirect interaction between players. And that's really sharp. And it's a fun, satisfying thing trying to sink, set collect the right pirate ships that you're trying to sink to get to fill up wanted posters to score points and drafting the cards that will give you the shapes you need to, um, the shapes of sea dragons you want to do later uh, as you race to, um, you know, clean the seven seas from the scourge of nasty pirates and oh the game is just so fun to play and it looks gorgeous too with all these colorful sea dragons as they spread out over the board so i really like it a lot my only problem with it is as a two-player game it's a little bit less interesting because there's only one other player sea dragons out there. If you were to play this as a three or a four, then there are different colored dragons and you could decide, right, am I going to extend off of that dragon over there or am I going to send off that dragon over there? You've already got so much money. Giving you one more coin probably isn't going to make a difference, so I think I'll go that way. But, oh, if I go over there, that's the perfect thing for me. But then I'm extending off of both of my opponent's sea dragons and they both get a payday. So there's just going to be a little bit more fun puzzliness to it when you are playing with fewer players, and you have more to think about when you are expanding. Don't get me wrong. This is still a blast to play. Jen and I really enjoyed it. And it's a really fun, solid, and engaging um, tile laying game. Or, well, tile making game. Because it's a polyomino thing where you're building the polyominoes out of these cool little sea dragon meeples. And, you know, the presentation is great. The fun factor is great. It is a lightweight game. Very, very lightweight. Very gateway friendly. Maybe a little bit too lightweight for me and Jen, but I don't think I'd ever turn down a game of this, especially if I got to play it at a higher player count. And that was number 22. Again, mark my words, folks. Watch for the Spiel des Jahres. I think uh, this one's got a p big possibility. Number 22 of the month, Sea Dragons. Then, let's go on to number 21, Junk Drawer. Now, this is another very uh, laid-back, you know, lightweight, fast-playing, gateway, family-friendly, polyomino tile laying game. And in this one, we're trying to fill up our junk drawer. Everybody's got one in their house, right? You know that drawer where you just throw everything and you don't have any place else to put it? And then when you're looking for something... Where, where do we have batteries? Check the junk drawer. Where's that tape measure? Check the junk drawer. The, I, I love the theme. I mean, because we have, Jen and I have had many junk drawers over the years. And, and interestingly, in this game, you have four junk drawers and you're trying to fill them all up with all the various junk to um, score objective cards. And every time you play, you're going to get a different combination of these cards. Each card gets assigned to one of the four junk drawers you're trying to fill up. So each one of your junk drawers, you have very different things you're trying to do. Keep them empty. Keep them organized. Let them spread in different ways and all that. And the tricky part is every round, you are going to put four randomly selected by drawing a card um, pieces of junk in uh, four different junk drawers. But the problem is, often you'll say, oh, this is the perfect piece to put in my, in my green junk drawer, but I've already put something there this round. So I can't put it there now. I have to wait until next round, but I might not get that again. So every time you place a piece in this game, you are limiting yourself in the future. And it is a fun, fast-playing, puzzly game. Jen and I enjoyed it quite a bit. Loved the subject matter. Loved all the, you know, the, the pieces of junk are wonderfully introduced. And so much variety with all the different objective cards you could play. Our only problem, the only thing that kept this from ranking higher is this is a very, very lightweight game. Really, this is another great potential Spiel des Jahres nominee because it's perfect. Anybody can immediately understand what you're trying to do. And Jen and I, we just need something a little bit heavier, a little bit crunchier. So it's it's perfect as a gateway, but that's what keeps it on the lower end for us because we are tend to be more midweight games instead of lightweight gamers. But yeah, uh, we really enjoyed our time with number 21. 
junk drawer. Then let's move on to number 20, Lata, which I believe is Portuguese for tin. And in this game, we are running uh, manufacturing houses trying to manufacture tins of uh, sardines to ship all around the world. And this game, I got to say, is so weird and so interesting the way it works um, because there's uh, you play through six phases each phase you go through a few steps first you bid for turn order then you um, in turn order turn order is everything in this game you draft to get new extensions uh, for your production then you produce based on the cards you put into your factory then you sell what you produce to foreign markets then uh, you take the money from that and buy objective cards which is how you score points so on the surface, pretty simple, pretty straightforward. And it is. It's a pretty fast-playing, streamlined game. But what's weird is, one, the way you build and produce... Cards produce from left to right. So if you pay a lot of money to build something all the way on the right, because it's more expensive to build, uh, put a card into the right half of your uh, production facility, then every card to the left of it can use that card to the right to combo to make different things like um, sardines and tomato sauce, rather than just straight-up sardines, which maybe certain countries want. And on top of that, you can overbuild. If I don't need this card anymore, I really need this other card and I can do without, I could build on top of one. And that's the way you can save money um, by not spending money to build so you can buy the objectives later on. This game money is so tight. Um, but the thing is, no matter what, even if you've got the perfect warehouse and you don't want to build it all, you must build every round. And so that puts a lot of pressure under you. And then you've got the production from left to right, and then the turn order base for selling and scoring points with objectives and all that. Now, like I said, turn order is everything in this game. And this is our one problem with it. I said up front, you bid. There's an auction for turn order. And you bid action points. The higher I bid, the less I can do in the round. That's a simple, clean, clear, elegant system. And I appreciate it. But it is blind bidding. And Jen and I generally don't enjoy blind bidding auctions. And we did enjoy it here. Because, wow, I bid really high because I was desperate to go first because I wanted to get that objective. And then we reveal what we bid. And you bid almost nothing. And so I wasted half of my action points. Now, that's not going to be as much of a problem in higher player counts, because chances are you're going to see a wider range. Hey, I'm glad I bid high, because I outbid Betty and Bob, even if I didn't outbid Jen. But in a two-player game, Jen and I found so often that we were frustrated by the blind bidding that that kind of pulled it down for us. Plus, I mean, it's kind of hard to put into words just how offbeat and quirky this game is with the way that it handles objectives and the way it handles production methodology. I like it a lot. It's also a fun solo puzzle, too. But And it would have rated much higher if it had gone for a different turn order resolution mechanism than blind bidding. But for me and Jen, blind bidding is just not something we dig. And that's what kept uh, Lata at the higher end of the list at number 20 of the month. Neat, neat game, though. Now, let's move on to number 19, Call of Duty, the board game. <clears throat> and now, this is not something you would expect me to cover. This is a blood and guts. We are mercenaries running around on a battlefield trying to kill each other as fast as we can. And so it is a very in-your-face aggressive dueling game, not something Jen and I tend to go for. And to be sure, Jen hated the subject matter, but she enjoyed the gameplay, and so did I, because this really melds some interesting gameplay mechanisms in fresh and interesting ways. Uh, specifically, it is a combination of hidden movement and programming. I love programming. I love it in every game I ever get to play. And it, the programming is really good here, where behind a screen you're planning out where's your mercenary going to run? Where are they going to throw grenades? Where are they going to plant landmines? Are they going to are they going to make a run for the flag? Are they going to stay in the periphery and try and snipe? Who knows? I got a plan in secret, and then we resolve our plans and see who had the better battle plan and who stands and who goes down and scores a point off of the other. Um, so. I, I, I love that because this is a hidden movement game where you are at once both the predator and the prey. In most hidden movement games, you're one or the other. One player is the sneaky person and everybody else is trying to find them. In this game, everybody's sneaking and everybody's hunting for everybody else. That's an awesome way to do hidden movement. Combined with programming movement, oh, I love it. So I love both of those things. And while I'm not crazy about dice combat roll to resolve, I think that works here too because it so beautifully captures the feel of the original shooter. So I liked every Everything about it. Um, but at the end of the day, as much as uh, as well as I thought this did, I mean, I couldn't imagine a better implementation of, you know, first-person shooters, which, to be fair, have a nostalgic factor for me because I used to make these games. I was the lead designer on Siphon Filter and Brink uh, back when I was a video game developer. But at the end of the day, 
I'd rather play a game where I'm building something. It's it, This was a fun diversion. It was quite unlike anything Jen I've played in years. And I think Jen would love it if it were any other... If this were set in Tolkien and um, one player was an Urukai and the other player was Legolas, oh, she would love this so much because she loves hidden movement and we both love programming. Um, and uh, you know, while I'm not crazy about dice, even the dice work well here because everything is just re resolved so quick. It's such a fast-playing head-to-head game. Also, it's got a great solo mode, very puzzly. I did not get a chance to play the co-op mode, but I suspect that's going to be good too. There's a lot to like here. The only thing that, um, the only reason this is coming in so high is because there are so many games I played that are about building things and creating things this month, and that's what I enjoy more. But if I, if, if we have to play a head-to-head -head battle, this is the one I'd want to play. Number 19, Call of Duty. The board game. Now, let's move on to number 18, Mythic Mischief, Volume 2. And it's funny that these two are right next to each other because what I, everything I just said about Call of Duty, I could say about this too. This is another game where players go head-to-head -head, um, trying to direct their fantastical fantasy students around a mythical hedge maze, um, trying to grab loot and stay one step ahead of the groundskeeper because we're all skipping class and we're, spo and we're supposed to be back in class and we'll get detention and all that kinds of stuff. Silly, fun um, you know, setting. But what we're really trying to do is use all our special powers. In this game, there are so, there's so much ace symmetry to the different factions you can play. They go about doing things so differently, manipulating the board. But what we're trying to do is manipulate our opponent's pieces when it's our turn so that our opponents will get caught by the groundskeeper, and that's how we score points. And so it is a battle to detention. Not a battle to the death, but a battle to detention. And uh, both Jen and I enjoyed it quite a bit. And I, I haven't put the video up. Uh, I, I will talk at great length. But, I mean, a lot of the stuff I said that I really loved about Call of Duty is true here, too. This is a purely tactical game. It's not like I can destroy anything you've built. All I'm doing is creating, uh, is scoring points off of you, but all that does is create more opportunities for you to use on your turn. Um, in Call of Duty and in Mythic Mischief, when I score a point off you, I literally make you more powerful for the next go-round. And I think that works nicely. Um, so, we like this one, too. And honestly, Jen loved the subject matter. The theme was great. So why does this one come in so low as well? Um, this game is maybe the crunchiest, most analysis paralysis inducing game I have played in years quite frankly. And I'm putting that up against Vita Lasarda games. I'm putting that up against, um, you know, Dave Turchi, super magnum opus, monstrously complicated Euros and whatnot. This game, because on my turn, I've got three characters who I can move around. I've got um, five different abilities I can use them on. And there is so much flexibility, so much variety. The rules are so simple, but the gameplay is so deep and so rich and so broad. Jen was taking 10 minute turns where I just had to, I'm just get up and come back in a few minutes after you're are you done i would call from the other room if uh if you cannot be fast thinking decisive players you will find a game that should take 20 minutes could take over an hour and that was the case for us um it's not the game's fault it's our fault um in fact actually i wanted to try to get jen to play the var the official variant that brings in a timer um because i kind of feel it needs it i love this game I think it's great, but um, I almost enjoyed it more as a solo because when I was just, my brain was melting as I was trying to figure out the ideal move to make, I knew you weren't, my opponent wasn't checking their watch waiting to take their turn because you can't plan in this game at all. When it comes back around to the other player, it's going to be a whole new world of puzzly. Uh, basically, every time my turn is over and I hopefully scored a point or two and got some loot, I then hand the board to you and I've given you a new puzzle to solve. And this is like a Sudoku level puzzle of, right, there's a million different ways I could go about this. What am I I gonna do now? And I see now why everybody loves this game. I'm the third person to cover this for the channel. Shay covered it, and it was either Ryan or Kimberly covered it. I can't remember, but everybody agrees it's fantastic. I think it's fantastic too, just a little bit too analysis paralysis inducing for me and my wife Jen. Um, which is, so it's a brilliant game and so one of the best co-ops I've ever played, quite frankly. But uh, still, because of the analysis, because of our brain chemistry especially my wife, Jen's. I'm going to have to bring it in at number um, 18. It's not you, Mythic Mischief. It's us. Number 18 of the month. Mystic, Mythic Mischief, Volume 2. And you can uh, watch for that. My run-through will be coming uh, next month when it uh, goes to crowdfunding. Okay. Now, let's move on to uh, number 17. Fiction's 
Memoirs of a Gangster, which is a cooperative game from publisher Ludanova. And uh, this is a game where we are gangsters. We are doing all the kind of gangster stuff, trying to launder money at a casino, trying to rob a bank, trying to um, chase down a cop car, trying to uh, influence an election, all kinds of mobstery type stuff. But we're working cooperatively to do it. And we're doing dice rolling, Yahtzee style dice rolling, and manipulating those dice with cards because we have a deck of cards that represent represent our henchmen. And um, on your turn, what you're going to do is you're going to look at the board, whatever it might be, whether we are trying to, you know, um, you know, rig the election so our mafia godfather can become the mayor, or whether we're trying to um, um, have a shootout in a warehouse, or whether we're trying to smuggle goods. There's going to be all different kinds of actions on the board we can do. Also, each player potentially has personal problems, like alimony is due, or there's a they've made an enemy of a particularly diligent cop, or whatever it might be. So we have problem cards in front of us that are actions that can be done as well. And on my turn, I'm going to pick an action or two and try to solve those actions by rolling dice and trying to hit you know points thresholds with the dice. But here's the deal: um, I pick an act. I've got cards in my hand that represent my henchmen. You know, um, uh, guys and dolls who can do all kinds of stuff. They're strong. They're physically strong, or they're good shots, or they're good drivers, or they're good influencers, or whatever it might be. Um, and they're multi-use cards because when I start a job, I'll pick one or two of my henchmen play them, and that will determine what dice I get to roll. The better suited they are for the job, based on their specialty, the more dice I get to roll. Right. Then I roll the dice. And unlike regular games, I don't roll and re-roll and re-roll. Maybe I'll get... Uh, there. You can get a lucky clover who lets you do some re-rolling, but often you won't get to re-roll at all. And often, after the roll happens, no, no matter how hard you tried, you didn't win at the blackjack table like you were trying to. Or actually, you're trying to launder money, so you're trying to lose at the blackjack table, and you accidentally win. So here's the problem. You, I, I failed. I don't get any rerolls, but remember I said our henchmen are multi-use cards? You can use them to be the source of the dice you roll, or after the roll is over, you can play those cards for special powers that let you manipulate the dice. Add extra stuff, ignore certain results, reroll things, flip things, all the kinds of stuff you would expect. Lots of variety in what these cards can do. Um, you, know, uh, you know, change the effects on the board, all kinds of stuff. And um, the thing is, after I roll, I could use the remaining henchmen in my hand, or you can use the henchmen in your hand to help me on my turn. And that's where the cooperation comes in. Because while we have a big old hand of henchmen, we can't really talk about what our henchmen are good at or what kind of special powers we have. But we can try to decide as a group, you know what? I think I'm in a good position. I can probably handle that job. I'm, let me take the wheel uh, this round or whatever. And so I go for it. I try. I play the perfect characters. I roll bad. And then you can jump in and help me. But by sacrificing those cards, that means eventually when it comes to your turn, you're going to have less dice to roll as well. And the more we use up these cards, we will eventually run out of them. And that can spell our doom. So one of the things we can do is basically revitalize the cards and get them back available to us again. So we're trying to juggle and balance a lot of things. And it is great. It is a really smartly designed system. And the core idea of what I just explained is played out across six completely different scenarios. Where, I mean, one of them, you literally have a car chase. The other one, you have a bank robbery where you're trying to control the, the customers and, and you know, get the alarms and, and grab the loot. So and, and then again, there's so much variety too because of all your personal life problems that just keep showing up in the middle of the job you're trying to pull off. So it has a great... Um, thematic grounding. Uh, if you don't mind, I have to say, my wife did not like being a gangster at all. She wished it could have been any other subject matter. I didn't mind at all, but I can see why some people wouldn't like having shootouts in warehouses or something like that with real world guns. Um, but if you can get, if, if you are drawn in by the subject matter, and you like cooperation, imperfect communication, because we can't talk openly, but we can still kind of strategize. And the strategizing only begins when the dice are rolled. Uh, that's when we start figuring out, right, who's going to play what cards. Um, so for me, it comes in a little bit lower at number 17, both because my wife didn't like the subject matter, so that was one issue, but also because I think this game is going to be a lot more fun at a higher player count because you have more of your fellow gangsters who can help you out after that role. In a two-player game, they do an okay job for scaling. Basically, every round you get to take one more action. If you're playing at a higher player count game, every player can take two actions a turn, but in a two-player game, we can take three actions a turn. That's okay. It ensures we can do more stuff, 
but it doesn't have as much interaction between players, between different players who can do different things. And there's less of an opportunity to discuss what is the best way to go. So I think this game is going to be at its absolute best. If you can get three or four gangsters sitting around the table, all trying to figure out, right, who's best suited to do this job? Who's best suited to help this other player who is failing miserably at this job? As we are atrophying, um, you know, losing a war of attrition as our henchmen get um, exhausted or or KO'd or arrested by the cops or whatever. There's a lot of fun here. Um, it's... Uh, really a really sharp game with so much variety. I, I cannot stress just how this core system works so nicely to basically give you six different games worth of missions to play in number 17 of the month, Fiction's Memoirs of a Gangster. Okay. Now, let's move on to a uh, number 16, Imperial Miners. Now, I got to say, I was really excited for this because it's from Portal Games. They pretty much never have a bad design. They always come up with really great designs in their games. And they've never worked before with Tim Armstrong. And I'm a huge fan of Tim from an older game of his, Orbis. And I've also heard Arcana Rising from Gray Fox Game is amazing. So I definitely wanted to see what Tim was up to next. I'm always interested in Portal Games. And Portal Games Imperial Settlers line is a brilliant collection of card tableau building games. And that's what this one is too. But instead of building an empire or a kingdom, we are invested in mining operations, trying to dig deeper and deeper and deeper into kind of fantastical minds. The thing that really makes this game interesting is on your turn, you're going to play another card to your mind. You're going to activate that card and then you're going to activate every card above it. And that's where things get interesting. When you have a nice chain of cards and you add another card to the bottom, although, of course, the deeper you dig, the more expensive it is, of course. But when you put that third card down, the jeweler, you get to activate it, and then you get to activate one of the buffs above it, the artist or the uh, or the feeding time. And then, if you pick feeding time, you get to activate above that. Activate your gold mill or the mushroom farm. And then, after you activate that, you get to activate your top level, which is getting more money for future actions or drawing more cards or whatever. This core idea is brilliant. That basically, as the game goes on, you basically make kind of an amorphous engine of all of these different cards. And when you put a new card down at the bottom of them, you can activate a whole different sequence of things as you're trying to find ways for them to combo each other and score you points and all kinds of things. And I love it. I love, love, love it. This could have been in my top five of the month, actually. For the for the core gameplay I just described, it's brilliant. There is so much variety, so many cards, um, and so many different ways they could combo together. Really fun and satisfying game with only one thing that keeps it um, at the lower end for me. I didn't mention, at the beginning of every round, before players take turns playing their cards and running their mining operation, a new event card comes out. And these event cards can be hugely powerful, hugely swingy. Often, most of the time, they're good. They're opportunities to draw extra cards or say, hey, at the end of this round, do a thing so you can score extra points or get an extra special power for the entire round that you can take advantage of. They're great. I love them. But what Jen and I found is, at the beginning of a round, we would often draw a card and I would say, yes! Oh my gosh, this is perfect for me. I'll be able to use this power throughout this entire round. And Jen would say, oh, the way mine, my mind is built, I can't use that power at all. Or I'll say, yes, I was almost out of cards. This lets me draw back up to my hand size of five. And Jen says, yeah, that's what I just did last turn. I wasted an entire turn drawing my hand back up to five. And now the event comes along and says, draw your hand back up to five. And I already did that. And I wasted an action. And I don't get very many actions in this game. You can see where I'm going with this, folks. I wish it would be such a simple, simple change to fix this game and make it honestly a potential top 10 of the year for me um, by making one change, which is, hey, you know what? I know what the event is for this round and I know what the event is for next round too. So throughout this round, I'm using this event, I'm planning for this event, but I'm also thinking about the round next. Maybe even being able to see two rounds ahead so I can see what the next round and the round after that is. Now granted, that would make the game much heavier and more crunchy. But that's, you know, that's catnip for us. That's music to our ears. So by all means, do that. This is my one complaint about the game. The events could be so swingy and so unfairly with no way to anticipate um, uh, 
benefit one player over another just through random chance, that that really brought it down for us. Like I said, I don't see any way that it would hurt the game at all to say, hey, you know, much like Dungeon Pets, I know what we're working on now and what the next thing is and the thing after that. I mean, there's so many games that do this. It lets you see events coming in the future. Like, um, The Captain is Dead lets you see the current event and two events in the future. Doing that here would elevate Imperial Miner's Probably into my top 100 games of all time, quite frankly. I think it, because the rest of the game is that good. So much variety, so much um, whimsy, uh, great presentation, just marred by one rule that I think would be pretty easy to house rule. But as it is, I'm going by the official rules, which is why Imperial Miners comes in at number 16. Okay, now let us move on to, <clears throat> excuse me, number 15 of the month. Tukana Builders. And now this is a tiling, a hex tiling sequel to an amazing roll and write um, called Trails of Tukana. And I love Trails of Tukana. Uh, and this is from the same developers. It's the same environment. It's a, basically we're doing the same things. We've got the island of Tukana and we're trying to create a series of trails all over the island to connect um, the different species of the island, the the birds and the, the 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 primates and all that, to the different villages, trying to make the right things connect up. Sometimes we're trying to connect villages to other villages or certain things. There's all kinds of different objectives you're trying to do. And like uh, the original Trails of the Con in this game, every when you set up, you've got um, different public objectives you're racing after. And of course, you're I mean, there's just basic ways to score the game too. And it is a oh, uh, uh, what do you call it a a bingo style game, which again was true for Trails of Dukana. Um, the lead player draws a tile and says, okay, everybody, I'm going ahead, or I'm sorry, not a tile, the, a card gets drawn that says, hey, everybody, um, you're going to put your, 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 this is the interesting thing. You're going to grab a random tile and you're going to put it on a volcano space or a desert space or a jungle space. So this is where it diverges from Trails of Dukana, where everybody pretty much had to do the exact same thing. And there was still variety in what people did. And it was just that the, the setup board kind of pushed us in different directions as part of setup. Here, um, every round, I can guess, you know what? There's only three cards left in the deck. Two jungles and a desert. If the next thing I draw is desert, where is it going to go? Um, because I'm thinking about all that while I'm placing the current thing. Because I know what the likelihood is whether I'm going to get a straight trail or a curved trail or a sharp trail or an intersection. It's all right there on the board. I can see what the likelihood is I'm going to draw. And I know if I count cards, what is the likelihood of where I'm going to build? And this is all the stuff I need to think on and cogitate while while I'm deciding where to put this, um, uh, you know, this th uh, three-space intersection. Right now, I've got to put this intersection on one of my remaining four volcanoes. Where do I put it? There's two of them that are really good. What's going to work well with what I'm going to end up doing next, if I can guess as best I can what's coming up? And I think it works great. Just like Trails of Tucana worked great. This is a lot of fun, and Jen and I really enjoyed it. I don't enjoy it as much as Trails of Tucana. I mean... I'll be honest, in part, I like drawing stuff. It is fun. It is uh, it is pleasant to actually con you know, draw the thing. It's kind of like there's an arts and crafts element to it. But the interesting thing about this game is this one is much more easy to math out. Like I was just talking about how you strategize in this game. You know how many cards there are left in the deck. So you know what you're likely to hit. You know what the likelihood is, whether you're going to get a straightaway or not. And so you spend a lot of time mathing out, right, what is the highest probability? What is my second highest probability? What is my third highest probability? And based on those things, what is the move I'm going to make? And if anything, I mean, this is great. To me, it started to feel a little bit more clinical, a little bit less, ooh, wow, and more, yep, I knew that's what was going to happen. Yep, that's what happened. And that makes for a very satisfying game. And honestly, if I were to, if I were a bet man, I would say my wife would probably like this more than Trails of Tucana. But for me, I like the original Trails better because it was a little bit more unpredictable, a little bit more tactical, where this is more strategic. And, I, and so for me, it comes in a little bit lower. Any other month, though, this would have been in my top 10. I just played so many games this month. Uh, and, you know, I could certainly see if you ever played Trails of Dukan and you said, boy, I'd like a more strategic version of that, please. That's what this is. And honestly, there's no way if you like Trails of Tukana, you won't enjoy Tukana Builders as well. Um, you know, they, they, they skin the same cat in different ways that really have a different feel. And again, it's the tactical versus the strategic decision making that makes this a lot of fun. Number 15. Tucana Builders. All right, now 
Let us move on to uh, number 14, uh, Sweet Mess Pastry Competition. Now, uh, this is a harvest resources and uh, turn them into points by fulfilling recipes type game. And, you know, that's, there's a lot of games out there. But most Euro games do that. Hey, get resources. We've got recipe cards. And, you know, do that to build buildings or whatever, or launch rockets or whatever it might be. In this game, they are literal recipe cards because we are trying to make desserts, cakes, and pies, and stuff like that. And the ingredients are chocolate and gelatin and cream and stuff like that. So, um... This game is definitely mouthwatering, uh, you know. I, you know, definitely, and I've got a huge sweet tooth. But it's also a very fun, crunchy game too, because the the crux of what makes this game really interesting and special is on your turn, you're going to pick one of the plates in this sweet mess of a kitchen, and you're going to grab all the tiles off of that plate. Usually, you might not always, but usually you'll try and grab all the tiles. And what that means is when you empty a given plate, say it was a plate of chocolate you emptied. Um, you take all those tiles, and all the adjoining tiles, uh, extra chocolate spills out. And so that's how new things come on the board. And I have to know that. That when I empty this plate and I'm grabbing this stuff, I am potentially making the perfect plate for you to grab because you were hoping for a little bit more chocolate. I know what it is you're trying to do. I can see that, and I've got to bear that in mind. But then, once I've got all these ingredients, we've got really strict storage restrictions. It is a real puzzle of, right, how am I going to store all this stuff so that I could then... And deploy it to make the perfect desserts. It's a lot of fun. It's a it's a very sharp game. It's a beautiful game. It's a lovely, puzzly game. It's a fast playing game. It is a satisfying game. Um, it's a simple game too. I would almost call this a gateway. It's maybe more of a gateway plus because of the extra complexity of you know the storage and all of that. But make no mistake, it was a blast. You can watch my run-through for it right now. I had a, a lot of fun playing it both. At, I did a two-player, and then in the extended, I showed how it works as a solo game, too, because it's a really fun solo game. And again, in any other month, this would have come in much higher. Still, and for this month, coming in at 14 is great. Uh, sweet mess. Alrighty, but now let's move on to number 13, Forever Home. And we were halfway through our first game of this, and Jen said, this might be my favorite game of the year. Now, granted, that's in part because of the subject matter. In this game, we are running dog shelters, training dogs so that they can find their forever home out in the city or the countryside or the suburbs or in foster homes. And this game is full to the brim of beautiful dog art. Uh, you know, so warm and charming. I mean, you know, there's a couple of dogs that look exactly like dogs we've had in the past. And it's just, oh, it's just so heartwarming. And what we're doing, it's hard. This is a very abstract, puzzly tile laying game because to quote train these dogs, we, um, on our turn, we're really spending our action points either drafting more dogs to put them into our shelter or drafting training cards. The training cards we have on hand tell us the patterns we have to put these dogs in to consider them trained. And so once we've got the right combination of dogs in the right pattern that matches one of our training cards that we have in hand, we can say this dog, the, this dog is trained and we um, take, or these dogs are trained and we get to send those dogs to a forever home. And then that's when the second half of the game comes in because every time you set up and play, each type of forever home has a different scoring metric. Whether you're trying to get you know different combinations or um, you know. Well, actually, it's always going to be different types of combinations in the different forever homes. And um, you know, players are competing to do the best in all of these. Plus, uh, different breeds of dogs are rated um, differently on a uh, side scoring track as well. So all these dogs can be scored in really unique ways, but it all comes down to what dogs are you going to train, what dogs are still going to be in your shelter at the end of the game, and where what forever homes did you send them to because you're competing on every one of these metrics with your opponents. All the while, uh, figuring out the best way to do it, it through the um, tile laying and card drafting. So, this is a solid, well designed, largely abstract with the most wonderful theme pasted on top. And I won't deny, this game comes in so high because both my wife, Jen, and I are dog lovers. Um, but it's still a really fun, solid design, too. But it is, be, uh, it is the best dog themed game we have ever played. No, that's not true. Dog Lover is the best. This is the second best dog-themed um, uh, game we've ever played. Uh, what would I change about it? I can't really think of anything because it's a great, it's a perfect gateway game too. This is a game to keep. Whenever we have people in our house, 
who love dogs and we need to play a game with them, this is the game we will play. Make no mistake about it. But Jen and I will enjoy just because every time we do, it's so wonderful and heartwarming and satisfying. It's it's light. It's definitely gateway-ish. But there's enough meat on the bone, the dog bone, that um, Forever Home comes in at number 13 of the month. Oh my gosh, so many games, folks. Let's keep going to number 12, Nebula. Now, this game blew me away because after we finished our first game of it, Jen says, that's a five. Jen gives, I mean, we play probably 200 or so games a year. Jen gives maybe 10 or 15 five stars, and this is one of them. I'm, I'm kind of uh, spoiling the monthly Gen Jog, which is a companion show I do. Here you're getting all of my opinions. In the Gen Jog, you get all of Jen's opinions. But Jen fell so hard in love with this very, very abstract game uh, that is all about drafting cool little plastic stars, star shards, uh, from a central board using a really neat drafting system where it's very puzzly. From the central board, you're going to grab um, three stars from the three different clusters, but to do it, you there's hourglasses on each cluster, and you have five time to spend, which means you have to move those three hourglasses a total of five spaces clockwise or counterclockwise, and then wherever they end up, those are the stars you grab. And then you take those and you install them in your own nebula. You've got secret objectives you're trying to do with these stars. You've got public racing objectives you're trying to do with these stars. And if you play with the advanced version, you've also got other public objectives that are variably scored based on how much players value them over the course of the game. This game is very, very simple to teach. Really fast playing, a, an elegant and very fresh and interesting draft system uh, combined with uh, a very, very fun and puzzly, they're not tiles, star laying system with a whole big collection of objectives you're trying to chase. And not for nothing, the game is gorgeous. It is just drop dead beautiful. So it's got a lot of stuff going on. Me, I like the game quite a bit. And I, that's saying something because I tend not to like abstract games. I mean, you know, this is definitely an abstract abstractish game. Jen loves abstract games though, and this is probably one of her favorites of all time. She was so blown away. Jen and I were actually planning uh, you know, later on this year to do a five or six month long road trip down to Mexico, and Jen said, put this in the rig. I want this one on the road with me because I want to be able to play this more. So, And that is how much she loved it, and I think it's great too. Number 12 of the month, Nebula. Okay, now let's move on to number 10, Lunaris 45. Now, this is a, uh, oh, what would you call it? It's a, it's, a, it's a competitive game where we are scientists and engineers trying to solve technical problems for a moon base. That's what the theme is, but the theme, sadly, does not come through at all. They don't even bother putting any descriptions on the cards of what the problems we're solving are, because the, the, the cards, the problems we're trying to solve, are represented by dice that we have to roll. We have to get uh, three of a kind. We have to get full houses. We have to do all kinds of stuff. And really, what this game very much reminds me of is a Fuse, a brilliant real-time cooperative um, dice drafting game from Kane Klenko, where we've all got these car or these recipe cards that we're trying to get the right dice and put them in the right place. We're doing this the same thing, but now it's competitive and it's more Yahtzee-ish uh, because we, you know, on my turn, I have got uh, you know a certain number of dice that I can roll. And the tricky thing is, I am just going to roll them once. I said Yachius, but it's not quite so Yachius. I do get one reroll. And the thing is, I've got this grid uh, that's covered up with cubes. And one of the things I can do at the beginning of my turns is, if I want to invest in it, I can claim one of those cubes upgrading my operation. And there's three ways I can upgrade my operation. So I can roll more dice on my turn, or so that I can get more re-rolls of my existing dice, or so that I can swap dice from a common pool. Um, and so those are the upgrades I can get. But here's the problem. Every time I do one of those upgrades, I take those cubes and I put them on the um, value track. Because when I complete these cards, uh, you know, when I eventually get uh, three of a kind on a card or whatever, or uh, uh, all my dice together have to equal 20 or more, or, you know, and there has to be four dice that equal 20 or more or something like that, whatever it might be. I claim that card for myself, and we're racing. It, we're, we're going from a public pool, and I mean, we can both see, hey, I need to do one with all odds or something like that. 
And once I get them, they go into my supply. Um, and at the end of my turn, I have to use one of my precious actions, I don't get very many actions in this game, to trade them in for points. And so, I want to trade them in when they are worth the most. Right? And that's at the beginning of the game. Because every time I upgrade my engine to give me more dice, more rerolls, or more swapping ability, um, the all of my um, mission cards that I've completed become less valuable. So there's this really interesting pressure that I'm under to not upgrade my engine so that I can get more dice and more rerolls so I can do tougher, more challenging um, cha uh, card completions. Uh, don't uh, do those upgrades so that when I do complete the cards, they're worth two or three times as much in terms of victory points. And that is a brilliant and beautiful bit of tension because the uh, more capable I am, the less good I am at selling my, the, you know, um, talking up my achievements and I won't get as many points for them. And I love that idea. It is so interesting every round trying to decide how you are going to balance that. But that's not all because the other thing is, like I said, at the, you know, after I've made that up upfront choice of whether I'm going to upgrade my operation. I'm going to roll my dice, maybe have some rerolls, maybe have some swaps, maybe not, and try to you know complete one of the uh, three publicly available objectives, right? I'm going to do I'm trying to try and do those. I might not use all my dice for that. Every die that I don't use to complete, that die goes to the public pool that everybody can borrow from. So remember I was saying, one of the ways you can upgrade is by saying, hey, look, I can grab more cards from the public pool. How does that public pool get filled up? With, with dice that I failed to use, that I might fail to use that too. And you're like, yes, because that means on your turn, you've got that too, which is one of the things you need for that tougher objective. Wow, that extra little bit so pushes the design of this over the top and makes it something really special. Now, I will be honest. It is almost criminal that the developers of this game did not do even the tiniest bit of work to make this feel more thematic. I wish the cards had text on them saying, what are the problems we're solving? You know, I mean, something, because right now, I mean, this is a pure abstract. Um, because it could be applied to anything. This could be a big business simulation. This could be about building castles in Renaissance Europe. This could be about building the pyramids. This could be about, um, you know, cells trying to fight off viruses. It could be anything. And I wish there was a little bit more theme here because the gameplay is so crackerjack, so smart. I'm basically knocking it down a few because they could have done a bit more work and made it a bit more thematically engaging. But I'll let it go because it is definitely gameplay engaging in the biggest way. That is number 11 on the list. Oh, folks, it's so good. Lunaris 45. But we are not done yet. Let's move on to um, number 10 on the list. Kelte. And I got to say, folks, first of all, this game is gorgeous. It's got art from... Uh, the Miko, one of my favorite artists of all time, and it's a rondelle game, which is one of my favorite mechanisms of all time. And uh, it's basically about, I forget, I think we're uh, tribes of Britannia um, trying to fight off the Romans, if I recall correctly. Yeah, we're Celt. We're Celtic tribes. And every turn, you're going to move clockwise on the rondelle, like always. If you take a baby step, you'll actually get some resources. If you move really far, you'll spend the resources. If you move a medium distance, you won't get or lose any resources. You know, pretty standard rondelle stuff there. But what's interesting is after you've made the move, wherever the rondelle lands, you've got two... Four different actions you can choose from as a general rule. And those actions are getting more cards in your hand, which you need to do anything, um, converting those cards into permanent upgrades to your tribe, so it's like you've got those cards permanently in your hands at all time, no matter what you're doing, or spending those cards to build up fortifications or fight off the Romans. Now, which of these actions you'll have access to depends on where you landed on the rondelle. But what's really interesting is once you land, before you decide which action you're going to do that you have access to from where you've landed, you've got on hand a small handful of villagers who uh, will do whatever you need, whether it's farming or fighting or recruiting or whatever. And before you do the action, you can swap some of the three 
uh, people you have on hand with ones that are already on the board. So if you're about to do a military action, you could say, bye bye farmer who's been with me through thick and thin for most of the game. I'm going to swap you with a soldier so that I will have an easier time doing the military action I'm about to do. So you've basically got two collections of resources that you're trying to manipulate on this rondelle. Your cards, which are multi-use. Uh, they have icons on them that you spend in sets to fight, or they've got colors on them which you spend in sets to build, depending on what you're using them for. Uh, and also, you've got these extra people who will basically lower the cost to use those cards for whatever you want to do. And then on top of that, you can be converting um, your, uh, what do you call them, your workers into like permanent uh, accessories. And you can even convert them into wild cards. Now, all of this stuff you're able to do off of this rondelle is driven by these different public objectives that depending on choices all players make throughout the game will be worth more or less points. So you could really push hard on something, but then it turns out, oh, it's not worth very many points at the end of the game because nobody else was making that a more valuable task. But uh, whatever you choose, uh, you are going to be you know, right up to it to the very, very end. And it's just a really clever game where you've got this rondelle, but this extra level of control uh, because you're constantly swapping your workers in and out and constantly get building up a bigger hand of cards to be able to do these really big actions. It was sharp. It was fun. Jen and I really enjoyed it quite a bit, and it came in at number 10 of the month. Uh, Kelte, all right. Then we've got number nine, Amritsar, the Golden Temple. And now this is a big game, a huge, ambitious, crunchy game with a lot of stuff going on. And it is all about the rebuilding of the Golden Temple in Amritsar, which is, I, I guess, the epicenter of the uh, Sikh religion and is like one of the most widely visited temples in the world because it's completely plated in gold. And we are contributing to the restoration of this uh, uh, of, of the Golden Temple back, if I recall correctly, in the 1600s. But, you know, that's the setting. What is the actual gameplay? Well, it's one that I was born to like because it is a rondelle surrounded by a Moncala. Or wait, no, no. It's a Moncala surrounded by a rondelle because at the beginning of every one of your turns, you have the option to move your elephant, which represents you. It's not a real elephant. It's just a very, very cool, and by the way, gigantic, chunky, wooden elephant uh, with silk screening on it, and that represents you moving around to different districts um, in the city surrounding the palace. You can stay where you are, or you can move clockwise. After you have moved, and you can pay more to move farther, just like a standard rondelle, that's not the action you're going to do. You're just getting yourself set up. Then, the second thing you do on your turn is, on the inner wheel of, you know, of stuff surrounding the uh, Golden Temple, there are groupings of meeples, worker meeples. And this is a uh, Moncala. You are going to pick one of the groups of workers, grab all the work, say you grab three workers out of a given group, then moving clockwise around the Mandala, or I'm sorry, not the Mandala, the Moncala, you are going to drop worker off, worker off, worker off. The third worker, say you're picking up three, wherever you drop that third worker off, that indicates the action you're going to do this turn. Just standard Moncala type stuff. Pick up stuff and you'll know, sew them around the board and wherever you end up, that's the action you get to do. Although actually, wherever you end up generally gives you a choice between anywhere from three to six different actions. So wherever you end up, you could do a basic action, but if the worker you dropped off matches the color of the basic action, you get to do a bonus action also. But then on top of that, if the place where you dropped your worker off is the same location where you are, as represented by that elephant, you get to do a third action. So, this game is cool. It is all about trying to get this rondelle and this separate Moncala to work together in sync in what turns out to be a big, beautiful, gorgeous board where you're spending a lot of time gathering resources or donating them to the construction of the uh, temple. Uh, there's area control elements, depending on who's worked most on the north, south, east, and west. There's um, all kinds of upgrades you can do. You can give yourself more 
private objectives. You can make your elephant more powerful because when you drop your worker off where the elephant is, usually what you're going to do is an elephant power. And the standard one they can do is make donations of the goods you've got to the temple. But you can upgrade your elephant to be able to do more actions. Or you can do additional actions that were on the board. The, I mean, a perfect round in this game is moving your elephant into the spot so that it lands right where you're going to add a correctly color-coded worker so they will get to do a double action and then trigger your elephant. And it is just awesome when all of that stuff comes together. And it is complex. There are literally a lot of moving parts you are trying to juggle in this game. And by the way, the game is freaking gorgeous. Absolutely beautiful. So there is a lot to recommend here with Amritsar. I like pretty much everything I see here. Uh, and uh, you're in luck, folks, because in September, we're going to be getting a run-through of this up on the channel so you can see it in action. But there is so much going on, and I just scratched the surface. There's lots of different types of upgrades you can do, but just that idea of trying to make a rondelle synchronize with a Moncala, uh, and they both have different functions, different ways they work. It's just chef's kiss awesome. It is number nine of the month, month Amritsar. Okay, then let us move on to a number eight. How dare you? And this is a surprising one. This is not one I would have thought I would have put on my list because this is a very simple deck of cards that is a uh, party game. And in fact, there's hardly anything to show. There? I want to show some cards, but there aren't really any. So I guess I will show the back of the box because you can see some cards. Basically, this is a Trivial Pursuit style party game. And it's just freaking brilliant. What happens is, when it's your turn, you pick a number between 1 and 6, and somebody reads the uh, the, the matching uh, trivia question on the card that's on top of the stack to you. And it might be, I'm trying to think of some of the ones we saw. Um, you know, I mean, there are some that you know are a kind of general purpose knowledge, like, how many countries are there in Africa? But then there are other more far out ones, like, how many regular eggs could fit in an ostrich egg? Or, uh, I mean, just really, really far out uh, things, you know, I'm, gosh, I, I, I can't even think of them all now. Oh, you know what? I am going to, I am going to go grab it. All right. I've, I've got the, I've got the actual box right here. Just picking a random card. Um, what is the length of a Boeing 747? Or, uh, what are the number of languages the little prince was translated into? Or... The average number of sesame seeds in a Big Mac. <laughs> or uh, the number of years Brazil has had its own king. So as you can see, these are all numerical answers that you got to come up with. And some of them people might know, but for the most part, these are going to be things that generally people don't really know off the top of their head. And I mean, there is no pictures on board game. Let's just go back to the front. And here's the deal. So somebody asks that question, you then make your best educated guess. And you might have no idea, but you make an educated guess and you say, how many, how many, uh, how many um, sesame seeds are on a, let's see, I'll, I'll, I'll actually do one. Let me just pick one more randomly. Uh, the human body. I mean, there's uh, several, and it would be... <laughs> what are the average number of farts per day? Right? I don't know. I'm going to guess. I have to guess. And I will say 25. On average, a human being farts 25 times a day. I don't know if that's right or wrong, um, but it's your turn now. And you have to either raise. If you think it's more, then you'll pick a higher number. Maybe you think, oh, it's more like 75 or 50 or, or, or you could just say 26. Or if you think I've already done a number that's too big, you can dare me. How dare you dare me? And if you dare me, then we flip the card over. We look it up and the number, oh, folks, it's 14. What was I thinking? I literally, I don't know. That's not a reflection of how often I fart a day. I was just, I have found pretty much every time Jen and I have played this, the numbers are always much bigger than we think they're going to be. Um, but anyway, so you, uh, if you dare me, and then it turns out I went too high, I end up taking the card. In this case, it would lose me three points. Um, but if I was right, if I had not gone over the number, then you end up taking the card and you lose three points. So it's kind of this daring game of, well, okay. You know, I mean, I could have said five. And you would have said, oh, there's no way five. Uh, eight. And then it would come to somebody else. And then it comes back to me and I'm like, I don't know. 
15? And then somebody says, well, are they, and if they dare, and it turns out the answer is 14, if they dare me, they lose the points. Otherwise, I lose the points. Incredibly simple. Easy, clean. Uh, the game comes with a ton of cards. Each of them have six, so you've got tons of variety built in, and it just works. Honestly, this game is freaking brilliant. Uh, I mean, this is, I mean, I've played different board game, you know, trivial pursuit knockoffs over the years, and I don't think I've ever seen one better than this because it's just, you could play it anywhere. You could play it standing in line. You can play it with a big group of people. You can um, just play it with two and have a good old time. Um, and you can play it with a, all age groups because so many of these things, there's just no way a person would be able to, um, oh, guess the uh, length of the longest beard in human history. Or the, uh, um, the height of the Great Pyramid. Or the height of the Louvre Pyramid. Or, one more, one more. The average temperature on Mercury. And, you know, take your best guess. If, uh, if people dare you, you get the points or not. And it's just great. It's a lot of fun. I have uh, played this successfully with Jen's folks. Jen, I mean, this is something I'm just going to keep on the ready. I, it's the ultimate. It's not a gateway game. It's clearly a, a simple trivia party game, but it just does it so well. I am really, really impressed. And honestly, I never would have thought in a million years that a trivia party car deck of card games would rank so high on my list. But it's just done so fun. Oh, and by the way, folks, it has... Extra bonus rules, you can um, introduce double dares, where if somebody dares you, you can double dare them back, and then that doubles the jeopardy. They have to decide if they're going to stick with their original dare, or if they continue to raise. And um, then there's also a doubling rule, that if you double what somebody estimated, you get a bonus that basically is positive points instead of negative points. I like everything about the game. I even like the way it ends. Because at the end of the game, it's going to end once somebody, or, you know, depending on player count, once a certain number of cards have been uh, collected by somebody. And then everybody tallies up all of these little geese that are on the top of the cards and whoever has the most geese is deemed the silly goose and that's it there's no real winners or losers the winning and losing was just playing the game um but instead i mean you're, i guess you're saying hey whoever has the uh, most is the uh, loser but the rules don't say that the, whoever has the most is the silly goose and i really appreciate that too that makes it more welcoming and less cutthroat and trying to because you know i mean some of these things are going to be easy for some people and hard for others how can you judge that it's just more hey let's try to have a score but it's just to see who was the silly goose today and you know there's no hard feelings I'm, I'm just totally impressed by this game. Number eight, how dare you? Okay, then let's go on to number seven on the list, Revive, Call of the Abyss. Now, Revive made my top 10 games for, what was it? Was it 2021 or 2022 it came out? I feel like it was 2021. Now I want to look that up, and I will. Revive was in my top 10. No, it was last year, 2022. And it was a great, great game. Um, a lot of fun. And this is a great expansion. Now, this expansion does not reinvent the wheel at all. It just does what a lot of people want out of expansion. Hey, um, four new tribes, all of whom have unique abilities that you can unlock as you level up. A uh, bunch of new machine uh, types that you can build as part of your engine building stuff. And a bunch of new citizen cards that you can draft uh, so you can deploy them. This is basically a deck builder where there are multi-use cards and depending on where you slot them onto your board, they will do different things. And you can watch my run through for Revive. Uh, there's a reason it made my top 10. It made a lot of people's top 10 of the year. Very well respected. So a new expansion comes out, just adds a bunch of new content, most of which is nice. There is one significant thing it does, which it adds this whole other progress track called the um, the Psychphaz track, which you can move up. Instead of scoring victory points, you can work your way up this track as well. And if you climb up high enough, you unlock super powerful mega -faws follower cards that um, are great, especially because, you know, a big part of this game is, hey, when it's not my turn, I could uh, spend an action point to activate cards that you have played. And if you've unlocked those big super cards, I could play that. I could get those bonuses as well. Revive just gets better. Um, I mean, I personally, I would have loved to see something that was a bit more just like, wow, this fundamentally changes the core ideas of the game. And there are some cool things like uh, putting big lakes that, um, you know, kind of become big things we have to travel around on the main board. So the board traversal becomes a bit more complex and interesting and engaging. But I mean, overall, it's just continues to be a gorgeous game, one of the uh, best of the year, and uh, just giving you a whole bunch more of what you already loved uh, for Revive. It is number seven, Revive, 
Call of the Abyss. Okay, then we go on to number six, Footprints. Oh boy, I really like this one a lot. And I've, I've mentioned this before. I think, you know, this game is really getting its launch at Essence Field. Uh -huh. And every time I've ever been to Essence Field, there are always folks asking me, hey, what's the big hidden gem? this year? What's the game that you thought was really, really great that probably is going to fly under the radar and not everybody will find it? And this is my answer now. And I'm just lucky that I got to play it ahead of time because this is a very, very cool, fast-playing engine building game where um, you have a very, very tiny deck of cards, just 14. And the game is over once you've gone through those. Every round, you are playing these cards to, well, to do a bunch of different stuff. Each card is multi-use. You can use them for their top or their bottom action. The top actions generally translate to you traversing uh, the board because we are in the, um, it's, it's the end of the Ice Age. We are having to migrate because of mass flooding. And along the way, we are trying to leave our footprints behind. We are trying to make etchings that uh, people will discover thousands of years in the future. And that's one of the main ways we score points and uh, get bonuses and whatnot. So we are trying to travel uh, based on using the top action of the cards from our hands and get into positions where we can do these etchings, score points, trigger bonuses, and all kinds of stuff. But we can also play these cards to not travel, which is what we're here to do, but instead to upgrade our ability to travel so that on a future turn we will be better at that and that is always every single time for every single card a tough choice because you only have so many of each of these cards there's only 14 if I recall correctly so every card you don't use to move to upgrade your ability to move later is a tough call to make and then on top of that as you travel along if you can hit certain spots you're collecting resources that you can use for those etchings you are also upgrading your tribe's abilities so that when you do those bottom actions so that when you do make a move, you can travel really, really far. And you start off making small moves, but by the end of the game, you're making huge, big monster moves uh, as you combo all kinds of things together based on the upgrade paths you have chosen for yourself. And it's fantastic. Uh, both Jen and I really liked it a lot. A total keeper for us. And um, you can check out my run-through to know more about number six, Footprints. Okay. Then we go on to number five. It's an expansion, Tenefir Second Curse. And now I covered Tenefir when it was crowdfunding many, many years ago. And I was lucky to pick up a copy of the Second Curse uh, expansion when it came out a couple of years later. But I only now, I've had it on my shelf of shame for, for a few years now. But I finally made the time to get it out and play it. And it reminded me just how fantastic uh, Heroes of Tenefir is and how this Second Curse expansion makes it even better. This is another one of those expansions that just adds more. New playable characters with, with cool, fun stuff in... Oh, I haven't mentioned. Uh, Tenefer is basically a deck-building dungeon crawl. Uh, push your luck game, cooperative style. And those are all things that I love. Uh, push your luck as part of other mechanisms I love. I love cooperation. I love dungeon crawling. And um, and I love deck building. And uh, you know the whole nation, notion of this game is you have a character that's unique to you. You have starting cards that are terrible. You um, We as a group decide what dungeon we're going to go in. And then we have to play a push your luck game. With every single card we draw um, you know, getting us closer and closer to beating the bad guy, but also burning through our deck really fast. The problem is, in a given turn, we cannot draw more than three cards from our deck. So we have to decide, okay, well, I've drawn these three cards, and oh, this is okay, but I didn't really do much damage to the boss we're trying to fight. I don't think you'll be able to finish it off. So do I throw these three cards away and try again? But one of those cards that came out had one of my cool special powers. Am I going to throw that special power away and not use it so I can draw again, knowing that the fact the faster I draw, the faster I'm going through my deck, and the less likely we'll be able to fight the next monster. And all of this is it within the confines of, yeah, we're working together. After I've made my final choice for the three cards I've got, you've got to do the same thing. And it's our combined cards that will determine whether we beat this monster or whether we get kicked out and suffer huge penalties. Tenefer is great. Watch my original run-through. Uh, Second Curse makes it even better. I love. I thought the new uh, monsters had a lot of cool special powers and the bosses. Uh, there's even a, uh, and like an epic mode you can play where you can go an extra deeper dungeon than has ever been gone before so you can get a longer, bigger game. I did not try that, but I look forward to trying it someday. But I was just so happy to be reminded, because I hadn't played it for years, just how phenomenal number five is this month, The Heroes of Tenefer, um, with or without, honestly, uh, the new expansion, 
second curse. All right, now let's move on to number four. It's Sky Team. And oh man, I had so much fun playing this this month, both with my wife Jen here in person, but also I played it with Ruel, my frequent collaborator on the channel. He and I did a, a two player, well, this is, I should say, this is a two player only game where we are pilot and co pilot working cooperatively trying to land a plane in very trying circumstances. And um, it is a game where during the actual round, after everybody's rolled their dice, we're going to take turns placing our dice. I play a die, you place a die, I place a die, you place a die. We're going to play four dice, and we can play these to reduce our, our speed, to adjust our flaps, to control our fuel consumption, to adjust our heading, um, to talk to ground control, to concentrate so we can control dice on future rounds. These dice have a lot of uses, and the thing is, when it's my turn and I've got to play a die, I don't know what dice you have. Um, but we have to coordinate. We have to synchronize. Like, if we want to keep level, we both have to play the same value die to the um, uh, the, the trim to keep us level. But maybe we want to, and I need to play a higher die so we can bank left, so we can avoid a mountain because we're trying to fly you know, a, a squirrely path or something like that. And I don't know what you have, and you don't know what I have. All the strategizing we were going to do about how are we going to solve the next round, we had to strategize. And if you watch the run-through, the well and I did, we did strategize. But then, once we roll the dice, we can't talk anymore. Because the actual gameplay portion represents just like a couple of seconds, where we're just making minute adjustments to the uh, the plane, and we have no time to strategize anymore when um, we're actually trying to deal with buffeting wind and turbulence and all that stuff. And it might sound impossible, but it is amazing, this game, just how you can get simpatico. And if you can make... If you can play things that at first glance to your teammates, why would you do that? You If you had that number, you should have put that over there. Oh... Maybe you put it over there because you've got this other number. Oh, well, if you have that other number, if I've read what you're doing right, then if I do this... So you can read between the lines with the way you play these dice if you want to play well. And you need to if you play at the higher difficulty levels. And it's a blast. I love this game. This would probably be in my top 10 of the year. I have one problem with it, though. Um, Jen found it to be way too stressful. And if I can't play with her, there is no solo mode, then I have no use for it. So it's probably not going to stay with us. But if Jen, I mean, and, and Jen appreciated it. She thought it was brilliant and smart and all that. But for her, uh, it, it, it is. When you play at the high difficulty levels, it's incredibly stressful. No matter what special powers you unlock and all of that. Um, and uh, you know, I, I just don't know if she'd want to go back. She tends to like co-op games that don't push you quite as hard and this one is exceptionally challenging but in the best possible way one of the most thematic games i've played uh, people who say oh it makes no sense that people aren't talking yes it does watch our run through and we will explain why and uh, you will have i guarantee you will have a fun time watching ruel and i try not to crash a plane in number four of the month Sky Team. Alrighty, now let's move on to number three, Mist Wind. And now this is that rarest of beasts, a pick up and deliver game that Jen and I really dig. Um, you know, I mean, pick up and deliver, you know, the idea of just moving our way slowly around the board, picking up goods in one town, and then moving over several turns to get to another town to drop them off, which, make no mistake, you definitely do that in this game. Um, especially at the beginning. You do not have, I mean, well, first of all, what you're, the trucks you're driving are very, very cool. Fantasy flying whales. Um, and we're not flying over the ocean. We're flying. Oh, we're we're up high on mountain peaks, and we're flying over the clouds below. Has a wonderful theme, a wonderful setting, wonderful components. Uh, I think this game is probably going to get nominated for best production of the year, and all of that because of, of its just incredible whimsy and uh, just lovely presentation. So anyway, I went in thinking, well, here's the deal. I don't like pick up and delivers. But I really do like Daryl Andrews and Adrian Adamescu when they've worked together in the past on some designs like Sagrada. They've produced really amazing things. And I also saw the game as a worker placement. And I thought, that worker placement idea sounds really cool. And then it turns out, I fell hard in love, as did Jen. We both love the way worker placement is done in this game, where you have workers numbered one through four, you have to get rid of one of them in secret, and then um, secretly choose where are you going to send all your workers um, and try to figure all that out without knowing what's going to be blocked by your opponents. The worker placement is super duper, top of class, next-gen, amazing stuff. So... 
I went in thinking I was going to be kind of bothered by the uh, the pickup and delivery and eh, whatever, but the worker placement was going to be amazing. And it turns out the worker placing was amazing. What I didn't expect is the pickup and deliver is pretty amazing too. Because after you make some investments, you can actually start building route markers that let you effectively travel around much faster. And by the end of the game, your whales, because you can actually get multiples and you can spend your movement points among them multiples, are can effectively start teleporting all around the world. And it's absolutely phenomenal. So the worker placement in Mistwin is best of class. If I was doing a top 10 worker placement games, I would probably seriously consider putting Mistwind on it because of how it totally redefines worker placement in the best possible way. But then it also does the same for uh, pick up and deliver as well. And that's not something you see every day. So Mistwind, folks, is something really special, which is why it makes number three this month. But even more special, number two on the list, Creature Caravan. And this is from designer, artist Ryan Lockett. And unfortunately, I have not filmed it yet. Actually, as you can see, it's set up here. I'm literally going to be filming this tomorrow morning. So I don't have any video for you yet. And I apologize for that. Um, but, and, and I believe, actually... There really aren't very many pictures on Board Game Geek either, unfortunately. But here's one of this prototype, um, you know, early in play. It looks like the game hasn't really set off much yet. But here is what is happening in this game. We are a nomadic tribe trying to move from the left side of the board to the right side of the board. Um, and the further we get, the more points we're going to score. And we're trying to hit all the uh, hot spots along the way, temples where we can get more resources. There are places where we can fight. I forget what they're called, the, the crystal zombies or something like that. That's a way we could score points. We can be um, you know, getting resources and then selling them in the market to score points. And uh, you know, a, a bunch of the same kind of stuff you normally do. The trick of this game is, though, the way it works every round, let's see, is the other picture yeah every round the first thing we're going to do is we're going to roll dice and um sometimes maybe you'll have some re-rolls but for the most part we're just going to roll these dice and then do dice worker placement at the beginning of the game we just have our own player board which represents where we can place our dice to harvest resources or fight monsters or trade at the uh, market or draw more cards or etc uh, etc et but the most important thing is we can um use our dice to move through the environment and we can also play more cards and the thing is at any given time you've got a big old hand of cards and I mean, uh, since I'm about to set up, you know, I'll just uh, throw a couple of them on screen. And these cards give us more places that we can place our dice over time. So we start out with some very, very simple selections that we can use our dice. We roll them when, you know, depending on what we get, and maybe we can manipulate the dice a little bit. For the most part, we just have to make do with what we got. But the more of these cards we put into play, the more options we have to do things, and the more combos we can start creating for ourselves that will make us more efficient with the same dice. Never mind the fact that we can unlock more dice and start rolling more dice also, depending on how we do upgrades, so that we can travel faster and faster and faster. And um, by the end of the game, because we only play for 12 rounds, or is it 14? I forget. But I mean, the important thing is you cannot play more than 12 of these cards. And you're going to play for roughly that number of rounds as well. And so the trick of this game, it's less about traveling the board, which is why I got a picture of, and more about getting the right cards played that combo well together that, so that no matter what you roll with your dice, you're going to be able to do big, cool, impressive things. Now, um, the game looks great because it's from designer Ryan Lockett. And uh, it's a great design because it's from artist Ryan Lockett. Ryan Lockett never fails uh, to uh, surprise and delight. And, you know, for the last few years, he's been on a kick of doing bigger, more ambitious games like Now or Never and Near and Far and Sleeping Gods. Big, huge, epic, sprawling narrative games. This is him kind of getting back to basics. There is no big narrative driving this game. At least there's not none in my um, particular. This is just more of a, hey, you know what? Just play the game and have fun. Um, you know, So it kind of harkens more back to 
Oh, geez. His earlier stuff, like Before, Above, and Below. And I love it. Uh, because it means we're not distracted by all the cool, pretty narrative and storytelling. Not that that stuff isn't great. But this is just to-the-metal gameplay. Like City of Iron and whatnot. And it is phenomenal. Uh, it is so satisfying. As the game goes on and you have more and more cards and more and more ways they could combo based on what you roll, it is just a blast to play. And I cannot wait to film it for you. And I cannot wait to share my run-through for you, which will be coming in September because it's going to be crowdfunding then. And I'm just telling you right now, folks, spoiler for my uh, for my video that I'll be putting up in a few weeks, it's my number two game that we played in August. It's absolutely fantastic. No surprise. Creature Caravan. Okay, but folks, there is a number one game and you've made it this far. What is it? Even fall. I'm telling you right now, folks, this is my odds on favor for game of the year, or probably top three games of the year. And really, at its heart, it's a very simple game. It's uh, all about running a witch's coven, um, you know, trying to be commune with nature and um, get cards played that will give you access to different resources and different powers, um, and doing it uh, through worker placement. Uh, because at the beginning of the game, well, actually, for the entire game, we have eight witches in our coven. Four young witches who can basically be deployed anywhere, and then four elder witches who are a little bit slower and can only be deployed to worker placement spots that you add to your, um, what's it called, the inner ring. You've got your outer ring where you first play cards. And um, when they are up there, that's when they are giving you access to all kinds of cool special powers that you want to hold on to because you can ride Ride those special powers to victory, the way these cards combo when you first play them into your outer ring. Never mind the fact that you can harvest resources from them too, which will drive everything. But the trick is, as powerful as those cards are, when you first get them played in your outer ring, eventually you need to transport them to your inner ring. Because that's when they lose their cool special powers, but they generate victory points for you instead. And that's also when, once they're in the inner ring, that your um, elder witches have worker placement spots they can go to. So the more of them you get transferred, the less powers you've got, but the more points you have, and the more unique worker placement spots you have as well. And this is just freaking cool. It actually reminds me of one of the greatest card uh, tableau builders of all time, Elysium. Elysium had this same idea of, hey, you play them, you play your cards on the mortal plane, but then you bring them over into Elysium so they can be scoring points. And this is just a brilliant mechanism whenever you see it. When you play a deck building game where, hey, I want to get all these great cards in my deck, but they're not worth anything unless I pull them back out of my deck. I like to call those deck deconstruction. This is kind of, kind of like a tableau deconstruction, and it is so cool. Um, absolutely amazing. A ton of variety in the cards. I'm, I'm telling you now, I'm calling it now, as people start getting their hands on this, this is going to make a lot of top tens of the year for people who play this. This is up there with your Race for the Galaxies and um, and your Elysiums uh, I mean, and your Imperiums, as I think this is going to go down as one of the greatest modern designer card-building tableau games of all time. And I've just scratched the surface. There is so much going on in this game, folks. Hopefully my run-through does a good job of, of just... You know, tapping into just those core things that make it so tense, so challenging, so much fun, so much variety too. The different covens you can play have wildly varying special abilities of their own. All the cards have all kinds of unique stuff. It just blew me and Jen away. My favorite game of the month. Easily one of my favorite games of the year. Jen really loved it too. And if you're watching this show, you're probably a little like me. I bet you you'll like it too. My number one game of the month, Evenfall. And that is it, folks. Oh, my goodness. That was quite a bit. Oops, I pushed the wrong button. There we go. Zoomed out a little bit. And we are done. But we're not done yet, folks, because I have to say thank you to all those people whose names are zipping by right now. And as always, at the end of the month, I've got to give a special shout out to um, certain high-level backers who help keep Rotto running. So let me pull up my list. Okay, here we go. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you to Dr. Fu, Aisa Samuelonis, Amber Rail, Adrian Dong, April, Dennis Inti, Dave Salvatore, Blake Wilson, Dan Hannigan, Nicholas Elkins, and Victory BHG. Then, a more subdued thank you to Charles Hill, Sharon Laubach, Marlon Cruz, Steve Ercolini, a Marilyn a Mom Gamer, a Mike Bloom, Caitlin Albert, Heather Rudarian, and then, oh, thank you. 
so very much, so very much to Chris Arnold, Davey Davis, Cobra Misfit, Eric Z, um, uh, Chris Steele, Jerry Reese, Kisa Griffin, Demnoa 2030C, and finally, a major Donka Shane or Donka Shun to Hans Peter Bach, uh, KB, Graham Wallace, Jeff Young, Jeff Glazen, Jimmy Schroeder, Hansen, Cheryl Howard, uh, Jay Huber, Stacy Lee, and Amy, and everybody else. Thanks everybody for keeping Rado running. Hopefully you enjoyed this. I know I said right up front, I was going to quick, quick, quick. What happened? I did not go quick as a bunny, but uh, hopefully you found some stuff there. Like I said, there's links for all the games I'm talking about down in the show notes. And in closing, folks, thank you very much uh, for uh, watching and subscribing and thumbing and liking and all the rest of it. And also, thank you to sponsor of the show, um, Arcane One and their new very cool game coming to the channel soon, Neotopia. Have a nice day, everybody. Talk to you later. So long. Uh, bye bye